Well, this morning, we're going to continue our uh, series here, and we're going to look at the next section of verses in Matthew chapter 2. So if you would, uh, turn here, chapter 2, verses 7 through 12, and we're going to be looking at seeking to worship the newborn king. That's our title for this morning, seeking to worship the newborn king. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. You know, in their quest to meet the newborn king, they stopped in Jerusalem. They didn't go straight to Bethlehem. They weren't led there yet, but they did go to Jerusalem, and that makes sense. Jerusalem being that capital city, that's the logical place to go. If you want to find out about a ruler who has been born, you go to that main city. And they did. They went there to find answers. And as word was spreading like wildfire, Herod heard about this, and Herod called them in. Verse 3, we see here that he was troubled uh, and all Jerusalem with him. And so he gathered together his chief priest, his scribes, all the, uh, of the people, and inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And so this kind of sparked some interest. And we would say more than interest. This was great concern uh, by Herod. He had heard that there was going to be a newborn king, or there was a newborn king. There was going to be one who would take the throne one day. And for him, that meant his job was over. His days were numbered. And he was very, very concerned uh, from this information. Because of this, he knew from the prophecies, as he heard from his priest and from his scribes, that there was a shepherd and a ruler that was coming to minister to his people. This messianic king that was to be born was a shepherd to nurture his people, to care for the people, to protect the people. And he was a ruler to lead them, to lead them in a way in which all the kings of Israel failed to lead. Now, even the good kings. We know Israel had good kings like David and Solomon and Josiah, but even those men on their best days are not able to rule and, and love the people the way that this king would. Only Jesus, the messianic king, that wonderful, glorious shepherd and leader, can lead his people in perfect righteousness and love them only as God can. And so this obviously concerned Herod. That was someone who was superior to him. That the promise that Israel had been waiting for, this messianic king, was born. And so he was understandably worried. Uh, and uh, anyone uh, to Herod, in his mind, anyone that was potentially in the throne was a threat. He did not want to give up his power. He did not want to give up his authority. He obviously knew that he would not reign forever. He's a mere man. He would taste death one day. But he didn't want anyone to take his throne from him. Uh, he wanted to cling to it until the very last moment. And this newborn child was clearly a threat and so as we look this morning at seeking to worship the newborn king, we're really going to look just at two points this morning. And the first one is this, Herod's false worship. Okay? We understand from the text that Herod had no intent to worship Christ, but that was the message he presented before the Magi, that he wants to go and pay homage to this new king. And so he was clearly lying through his teeth. He had other uh, very nefarious motives. He uh, wants to destroy this child. And then we'll see the Magi's true worship. Okay? In contrast to Herod's false worship, we'll see what true worship looks like. And we'll see three different aspects of that true worship as the Magi meet this newborn king. Well, as Herod is uh, understandably concerned because this messianic king has been born, uh, that was a threat to him. Jesus' birth as king meant that Herod was not the supreme sovereign, that Herod would not reign forever. Herod would have to put himself under the subjection of another. He was already there reigning, but he was under the thumb of Rome. If a new king comes in of the Jews, there is no place for Herod, and Herod would have to be subject to that king. He didn't want to lose the power that he had in Judea. 
He didn't want to lose his position or his privileges. He was full of pride and rebellion against God and anyone that would stand in his way. And so he would go to any lengths to make sure that he kept his power and his authority. And so he secretly calls in the Magi. If you look at verse 7, he calls them and he determines from them the exact time the star appeared. He wanted to know who he was looking for. When did you see this star? How did you know? And where is it leading you? He's trying to get all the information that he possibly could. Not to worship, but to destroy. If you look at um, verse 16, we see here, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. So a little more information there that we have in Matthew's gospel, that in this conversation that Herod had with these men, they said it's been about two years. And when Herod realized the men weren't coming back, and we'll get into that next week, he knew he couldn't target one single individual. And so based on the time frame that he was given, about two years of their travel time, he goes ahead and he issues the slaughter of all of those male children in Bethlehem and the vicinity two years and under. But he tells them the blatant lie. You, you go and find him, and when you find him, come back and tell me where he is. I want to go as well. I'm as excited as you are. This is wonderful news. The promised king has come. That wasn't the truth. You know, Herod, if you do any study on his background, whether it's in biblical commentaries or even secular history, you see that Herod was very cruel. He was a very ruthless man. Without getting into all the details and all the history of Herod the Great, you know, he had one of his wives killed, Mary Omne. She had two sons, Alexander and um, Aristobulus. They were heirs to the throne. When they found out that Herod had killed their mother, obviously they weren't happy about that, so what did Herod do? He killed them. Herod had no problem with snuffing out his own family. If they were a threat to him, he would take out those closest to him. Because to him, power and authority and riches and prestige and honor, that was most important to him. He didn't care who he hurt, who he stepped on, or who he would have to kill. His own wife, his children. History tells us he had 10 wives and 15 children, and it's safe to say none of them were safe from Herod. He would take out anyone that was a threat to him. There is a saying of Herod back then that said, it is better to be Herod's pig than to be his son. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty, pretty bad. Now, that would be like if you're talking about your own children or grandchildren. You know, they love the stray dog more than they love their own children. This stray animal is, is treated better and is, is more secure and safe than this individual's own flesh and blood. That's the kind of man Herod was, a very wicked and detestable man. You know, and we look at Herod, and, and we immediately condemn him and label him as evil, and he should be. I mean, the Lord condemned him. He clearly was evil. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, Herod really is just an example of humanity's depravity. And this is one of the reasons why Christ came. We could say perhaps the main reason. You know, we can, we can always say, well, what is the reason Christ came? Was to glorify God. You know, what's the reason Christ came? It's to save us from our sins. Why did he come? To save us from death, to give us assurance of, of victory over the grave, to make sure that we're with him in heaven. All those things are true. But when you look at what sin has done to this world, the, the work of Satan as he brought sin into this world and tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, and they fell and took all humanity into sin, sin has destroyed the human race. We still bear the image of God, but that image has been, been tainted by sin. And tainted to a point where it cannot be restored without the work of God, without the work of Christ. And so as wicked as Herod was, you know, the Bible tells us in Genesis 6, 5 through 7, that the intent of the thoughts of the heart of man all over the earth was continually wicked. And so God wipes out mankind with the flood judgment. 
Genesis 19 tells us that Sodom and Gomorrah was so wicked that God was going to destroy the cities. He would spare it if he found a few people there who were righteous, but he didn't. So the cities were destroyed. You go to the New Testament, you see Romans chapter 1. Talks about wicked men suppressing the truth with unrighteousness. You go a little further in the New Testament. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 talks about in those days and what we would say are the end times or signs of the end times. That people will profess righteousness, but they will love, they will embrace evil. I mean, this is the human race from the fall until the return of Christ. And as wicked as Herod was, he really is just indicative of the rest of humanity's depravity. We often will isolate certain individuals that we as humans say are the worst of mankind, the, the scum of humanity. And yet we have to realize that even though we have not, I hope not, killed family members, we haven't issued the decree to slaughter millions or millions, maybe thousands of innocent children. You look today, though, you have a lot of people who do approve of the slaughter of millions of babies. And some of them profess Christ. You know, this is just who humans are by our fallen nature. Not to minimize anything Herod did, but we need to understand mankind is in a horrible state without Christ. They need salvation. This is why Christ came. And he was a threat to Satan. He was a threat to Herod. And Herod was acting out in his wickedness. He is already devising a plan to destroy this king because of the wickedness in him. You know, this goes back all the way to the garden. I mentioned that just a few minutes ago. I know this statement of deception of Herod is the beginning, I believe, of Satan's attempts to stop the incarnate Messiah. If you study the Old Testament and you see the many times that Israel and, and Judah were attacked and they were, were sent uh, into slavery, and obviously God is there orchestrating their punishment and he's raising up Gentile nations and leaders to bring that judgment upon them. But there are times throughout history where Satan wants to destroy the nation of Israel. Well, when you look here after the birth of Christ, this is one of the first things that we see in the New Testament where Satan is clearly trying to wipe out the Messiah. In Genesis 3.15, there is this, this foretelling that the, the um, enmity will be there between Satan and Eve, between his seed and her seed, their offspring. That doesn't mean that Satan has children running around this earth, but there are those who are the children of Satan. There are those who live under his power, live under his authority. Herod was one of those individuals. We could say that Herod was one of the seeds of Satan. That, that he was trying to wipe out the child of the woman. Herod acted under the influence and under the power of Satan while he was seeking his own selfish desires. He would do anything to stop the plan of the coming promised Messiah. And so here you have Satan working through Herod to try to bring an end to the Messiah before he's even three years old. Whatever he can do to stop the plan of redemption Whatever he can do to thwart the work of God, Satan would do that directly or he would work through other human beings and Herod is one of his pawns. Herod is one of those unregenerate sinners who is wicked and is trapped in his sin and cannot escape the grip of Satan, not without the work of God. And so Herod was living out his sinful nature. His true nature and his desires were, were hidden under this false statement of a desire to worship. Yeah, you men go. You find him. This is a wonderful thing. This is, this is the thing that we were all waiting for. What a blessing has come to our, our nation. Go and worship this king. Go find him and then come back and tell me where he is because I want to worship him too. I want to pay him a visit. Clearly, he has no desire to worship Christ. The Magi were unaware of this. And so when you look here back in chapter 2, looking at verse 9, after hearing the king, they went their way. And the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. They had no idea what Herod's plans were. They knew that their motives were true. They were being led by this this, uh, this phenomenal light in the sky, something they had never seen before, but they knew was coming. 
And so they were ready to follow his star to the final destination. And they go away with what they believe is Herod's blessing, and they leave with great joy and expectation, seeking out the newborn king. Even though Herod's uh, worship or his declaration of the desire to worship was false through and through. Well, let's take a look here with the majority of our time looking at the Magi's true worship. Next week, we're going to spend a lot more time looking at Herod and his decree uh, to kill the children. But let's focus this morning now uh, at the Magi's true worship. You know, again, not knowing Herod's intentions, they went on their way to fulfill their, their sincere desire. They wanted to see this king. They wanted to meet him. They're going to continue to follow the star wherever it takes them. And so as they are going through the streets and they're being led by that light at night through the darkness, miraculously they find the house where Christ is. They find where he's staying. And as they find this newborn king, we're going to see their true worship manifested in three ways. They're going to rejoice over the newborn king. They will bow before the newborn king. And they will present gifts to the newborn king. Well, as they rejoiced, you know, they had made it two years. That's quite a long road trip. We took a road trip earlier this year, and that was 18 days. And that seemed like quite a long time to go all the way from Westminster to Michigan and back. We really enjoyed it. We loved the things that we saw. But after 18 days in a truck, you're happy to be home. And you're excited to come back. Well, we were excited to get to our various destinations. Uh, we went through quite a few states and hit quite a few places. Got to stop at the Petrified Forest. Got to go up to the Sandia Mountains in Albuquerque and ride that sky car like 10,000 feet above sea level. We got to see the St. Louis Arch. We got to see the house where uh, Laura Ingalls and Almanzo built. And they, they lived the rest of their days there. Lincoln's Burial Place. Mount Rushmore. I mean, we saw some great things there. Spent a lot of time in the truck, and when we finally got to those places we were looking forward to, there was some excitement. There was some joy because we had arrived. You know, I think of a uh, road trip that we had several years ago while Robert and Timothy were still living with us, uh, back when we didn't have a, uh, a vehicle that had the luxury of air conditioning. We had a 1994 Aerostar, and uh, on the outside... That thing looked like it had spent 40 years in the wilderness. <laughs> the engine was strong. The air conditioning had died years before. But we took that Aerostar all the way out to the Grand Canyon and Hoover Dam and back, just a little summer trip. Probably not the best time to go in a vehicle without air conditioning. It was over 100 degrees every day while we were traveling. I think we were in Kingman, and uh, it was so hot and miserable in the van that we went into a Kmart there. They still had a Kmart. And uh, we went in and we got the kids spray bottles. And we filled our ice chest with water and ice and said, you know what? Go for it. You can fill those bottles with ice water and shoot whoever you want, whenever you want, because this van is blazing hot. And so I would be driving there down the 40 and I would just, I would get ambushed from behind felt all these uh, liquid bullets just hitting my neck, and, and uh, it felt good, though. But I'll tell you what, it was kind of tight in that van. It was hot in that van. And when we finally drove up to the Grand Canyon, which, by the way, that was the first time that my family had been there. I, I had been there when I was a child, um, but they had never been there. They'd only seen it in pictures. And, and when we parked, uh, we went to the South Rim. We parked in the parking lot by the visitor center and walked over to Mather uh, Point, and, and as you're walking closer, you can kind of see the top of the mountains, and you get closer and closer and closer to the rails, and you're standing there on the edge, and you can just see this massive canyon. I mean, hundreds of miles long, a mile deep. And, and I remember standing there watching our children, uh, some fascinated, some not so fascinated, and that's the way kids are. You know, you think, this is going to be great, and they get there, and like, this is it? <laughs> okay, yeah, this is it. <laughs> Um, but I remember the look on Monique's face when we were there. She was just standing there and silent, and then I, I looked and I saw her, and, and tears were coming down her face. And uh, my first thought is, oh, you're not, I just drove you across states to get here. You're not upset, right? I, mean, I didn't say that. I'm not a fool. Uh, I quickly understood why she was crying. It was tears of, of joy, of amazement. 
And, and, and I remember her saying something like, it, it's beautiful. I've seen pictures, but the pictures don't do it justice. To stand here and see it, it was amazing. You know, and that's just a few days' journey. Here, these men had traveled about two years. Didn't have the luxury of vehicles or airlines or air conditioning. Everything they needed, they took with them. They left their family. They left their homes. They left everything to come and seek out the newborn king. And when they finally see him, they rejoice. Their long journey was over. They, they arrived at their final destination. The star leads them right to the house where Christ is. And, and, and their attitude is much like the attitude of Simeon in Luke chapter 2. When Jesus is presented at the temple on the, the eighth day after his birth, Simeon takes Christ into his arms and, and, and he is basically telling the Lord, you can take me home now because I have seen the consolation of Israel. I'm looking at the promised Messiah. There's nothing else in this world, nothing else in my life that can top this. I'm ready to go home, Lord, because of what I've seen today. Well, these men, when they arrive and they, they go into the house and they see Christ, they rejoice. Not just rejoice, but they rejoice exceedingly with great joy. The emphasis is there for a reason. This is like uncontrollable joy. These men are so happy that they have arrived and they are finally going to see the object of their, of their travels, of their desires. They're going to meet this Christ, the newborn king. You know, the Bible tells us, whether it's Old or New Testament, that we are to rejoice in God our king. Psalm 149, verse 2 says, Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. You know, a characteristic of true worship, of those who understand who God is and love Him and want to worship Him with sincerity, is that they rejoice because they know who He is and what He's done. When you understand who God is, when you study His attributes, His character, His nature, when you read the Word of God and you understand all the things that He has done to save you, all the blessings that you have now, all the blessings you'll have in glory, that should lead you to proclamations of praise and thanksgiving. You cannot thank God enough. And there is nothing in this world that should bring your heart more joy than knowing that you know your Creator, that you know the Redeemer, you know the King. The one who not only created you, but can condemn you, but has saved you. I mean, that should bring joy to our hearts. These men were true worshipers. They came, and when they saw Christ, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Well, as they entered the house, if you look at verse 11, after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. You know, they were standing in the presence of the king. And their, their natural response was to bow down, to honor him, to, to demonstrate their submission to him, their recognition of who he is. And so they bow down. You know, it's interesting here as they come in, the, the one that they were looking to meet was the child. It wasn't Joseph. It wasn't Mary. I'm sure that there were some, some nice words for them. I'm sure that they treated them with great respect. They understood the honor that they had, Mary and Joseph did, of, of bringing this, this promised king into this world. But they weren't there to worship Joseph or worship Mary. They were there to worship the child. They were there to worship the king. You know, even as a perhaps two-year-old child, you see that Jesus is worthy of worship. And why is that? Not just because he's a king, but because he is the king of kings, because he is the son of God. He is deity. He is the creator. And whatever earthly age he is, he is worthy of worship. These men understood that. So they bow before Jesus. They, they, they bow as an act of submission. They bow as an act of respect. They bow as an act of humility. 
They bow as an act of worship. And so they humble themselves and they bow low before the king. You know, these are things, submission and respect and humility and worship, that, that are lacking today in the vast majority of humanity. I mean, I'm not even talking about just the, the attitude toward God, but the attitude toward your fellow man. I mean, respect is not there anymore. Humility is gone. Submission is, is, is fought against. People don't want to be subject to anyone. You know, I, I can't tell you how, how much it, it annoys me when I go into a retail store. I, I worked retail for over 20 years before I went to seminary and, and see the, the lack of customer service. Not even a greeting. Not even a how are you. Thank you for coming to our store. Thank you for your business. How may I help you? Instead, their faces are buried in their phones. They're talking with someone else. They could care less whether you're there or not because they're getting paid by the hour. You know, and that mentality is, is just throughout our country, throughout the world. People will cut you off. People will, will I mean, do things to, to insult you, inconvenience you, and there's no excuse me. There, there's no I'm sorry, pardon me. There's no desire to, to um, be concerned for anyone else but yourself. That's just prideful wickedness, and it's growing in our country. We shouldn't be surprised. Unregenerate people, people who aren't saved, that's not part of their nature. I mean, it seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. And, and when you take that focus of, of submission and respect and humility that, that people detest already, they don't want to give that to their fellow man, you try to tell them to give that to God, there's even a bigger outrage when they hear that. They don't want to be subject to God. They don't want to bow down to anyone, especially to God. They don't even want to recognize that God exists. So they, they do all that they can to systematically remove God from their existence, to deny him, to say that he's nothing more than a figment of our imaginations, that we are, are weak-minded fools who develop the idea of a God as a crutch. They say, he, he doesn't even exist. Why should I be subject to him? I live for myself. I, I make my own rules. I determine my own reality. You know, I, I, I am in control of my own destiny. No one can tell me what to do. No, no one is as important as me. You have that kind of mentality, you will never bow before the king. You know, these men, these men were very well educated. Back in their countries, they had a lot of respect. They probably had a lot of wealth. They were called upon by kings. They served in the courts. And here they come, and they, in the presence of this two-year-old child, they humble themselves, and they bow down and demonstrate their respect and humility and submission before this divine king because they realize he is greater than the three of them combined. And so they naturally bow before him, knowing that he is greater than they are. You know, here's some verses to demonstrate why we should bow before God. You know, Moses on Mount Sinai, Exodus 34, 8. He's standing there and he is in the presence of the glory of God, not even the full glory. He catches the tail end. And it says, Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. Why? Because Moses knew he was standing in the presence of glory. He had to bow down before God. He wasn't worthy to stand before him. It's required of human sovereigns. Psalm 72, 11. Let all kings bow down before him. All nations serve him. Everyone is expected to bow before God. No one is exempt from that command. And, and God can demand that from us because he created us. He owns us. He determines what is proper for our existence. And to worship him is the right thing to do as one of the 
the, the uh, people of his creation. To withhold that from him is to rebel against him. And so all the nations are called to bow down and serve him. You know, he is our creator. Psalm 95, 6, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Now, this is one of the reasons why it's so important that we as Christians do not allow any concept of our existence other than direct creation by God to be accepted in the church. Because the minute that you say something other than God is responsible for creation, then now God is no longer the creator. He no longer has the rights or the privileges or authority over us. We need to understand God is the creator. We, we, we weren't created from some random explosion. We're not just a higher form of animal life. We are humans who are made in the image of God and, and created by him. We have the breath of life given by him. And, and as people who, who are created by God himself, we need to worship him, to bow down before him. Whether we are literally bowing down or we in our attitudes and our humility are bowing, whether it's bowing on the outside or bowing on the inside, we are to bow down before our creator. He is worthy of that. He deserves that as the one who is responsible for our existence. In the end, one day everyone will bow. Romans 14, 11, For as it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. For this reason also God highly exalted him, this is speaking of Christ, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, make no mistake, everyone is going to bow before Christ. You either bow to him now as you humble yourself, recognize who he is, subject yourself to him, and you accept that free gift of salvation through Christ that God has planned from beyond eternity past, and you are right with God, reconciled through Christ, or you can live a life of rebellion and rejection, and then when you die, you're going to wake up in condemnation, and one day you will stand before him at the great white throne, and guess what? You will recognize that he's king, but it will be too late. You will have no second chance to be right with him. Everyone is going to recognize his sovereignty and authority. Everyone's going to bow before him. Some will bow in this life and be saved. Others will refuse that, and they will bow when they are being condemned. But everyone will bow before him. These magi understood who he was. They rejoiced exceedingly to see him, and then they were bowing low before him. Well, they also presented gifts to the newborn king. They brought treasures that were fit for a king, gold and frankincense and myrrh. You know, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6, speaks of a, a promise of a glorified Zion and the ruler who will be there one day. And many see this as a reference to the, the, the millennium when, when Christ is established on the throne of David. It says, a multitude of camels will cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense and will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. And, and so these magi coming, perhaps, are kind of a precursor to that, that one day all the nations are going to pay homage to Christ. They will bring gifts to him. They will no longer rebel against him. And here you have these men from the east who are coming and bringing treasures fit for a king. You know, they bring gold and frankincense and myrrh. It's a gold nugget on the top left, and in the center there's a frankincense tree and the, the oil, the extract there on the bottom left, a myrrh tree on the right. And I don't know if you can see it, but they're kind of like little crystals, uh, the, the, the resins, the, the, the um, liquid that comes out of the trees. And those are turned into oils and incense, and they were used for worship. Um, not essential oils, so don't go out and think that's it, but 
We're, we're, they weren't marketing essential oils back then. That was the first thing I thought of when I saw that little vial there. But, um, you know, these were very precious oils. They were used in worship. Um, you know, gold, we know, we know the value of gold. Not my favorite metal. If you know Monique and you know me, you know us well, you know that we don't like gold. We like silver. We like platinum. We like white gold. We just like the look of it. But gold is valuable. When I worked with my father in his uh, jewelry business, back in the 80s, I remember going to Los Angeles and buying just the, the raw gold. And back then, we were paying over $500 an ounce. Now, I, and it's over $1,000 an ounce, I believe. I mean, it's just it's expensive. And, and, and it is used for so many things. It's a very precious metal. When you read Scripture, the Bible mentions gold over 500 times, more than any other metal. It's a metal that, that never tarnishes. It's a very precious metal. Many objects were made of gold in the Bible. Part of the high priest's garments were made of gold. The ephod contained gold. Crowns were made of gold. Chains were made of gold. Rods and scepters were made of gold. Coins were made of gold. I mean, gold was a very valuable, very precious metal. And so these men bring gold to the king. They bring those items of value to him in the form of gold. They bring frankincense as well. Frankincense is a, an aromatic gum resin, uh, and it's from the, the uh, Botswalia tree. That's the tree you see there in the middle. You find these in India and Arabia and Africa. So they come from faraway lands when you're looking at the land of Israel. And so they go and cut away some of the bark, and they kind of drain that sap, that resin. They collect it, and then they process it. They, they do their work with it. If you were to read Exodus 30, 34, you would see that, that frankincense was part of the incense that was burned in the temple. It was used with sacrificial offerings. When it was given, the offerings, then you would, you would burn the incense, and it contained frankincense. It was also used as a perfume. You can read about that in Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 6. Very fragrant, a beautiful, sweet smell, and it was used in worship. Myrrh is also an extract from a tree. And uh, this, like frankincense, it's extracted from the wood, and then it's soon hardened, and uh, it was valued as an article of trade. And so rather than going out with cash all the time, they would take items like frankincense, like myrrh, and, and trade with those items. It was used in anointing oils. It was used as a perfume. It was used in purification rites. It was used for embalming. Uh, when you read Mark chapter 15, verse 23, when Christ is on the cross, they offer him wine mingled with myrrh. And so it had a number of uses. And these magi brought not only gold, but they brought frankincense and they brought myrrh. Gifts worthy of worship uh, to a precious king. That if I'm going to bring anything to him, it has to be something of value. I cannot give him something that hasn't cost me something. And so these were precious items. You know, Psalm 72, 10 and 11 has messianic inferences when we look at this. Let all the kings of Tarshish and all of the islands bring presents. The kings of Sheba and, and let's just say, um, Seba offer gifts. Let all kings bow before him. All nations serve him. You know, as this psalm has these messianic inferences we we think of these kings that are gentile kings non-jewish people non-jewish leaders who are making it a point to bow and to 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 honor and to serve the one true king you have these men coming from the east who do not represent the jewish people they represent foreign nations they represent the gentiles and they are coming to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We know that one day all the nations will be blessed by Christ. He was a blessing to us in his uh, life and his death and resurrection as we have salvation. And one day when he establishes his millennial kingdom and is seated on the throne of David, he will be a blessing once again here on the earth to the nations. Not everyone at that time will serve him. There will still be those who rise up against him. But there is going to be a time of peace and righteousness that the world has not seen. And the nations will be blessed by Christ. These men were kind of a precursor of that. 
as they recognize the birth of this Jewish king, and they come humbly to, to rejoice and to bow and to present their gifts to him. You know, what about us? We don't go and meet this child king. He's come and gone. He's ascended. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's no longer here physically on the earth. We don't bring gold. At least I haven't seen that in the offering bags. That would be hard to deposit at Wells Fargo. Here's some gold. Here's some frankincense. Here's some myrrh. And here's a stack of checks. We don't do that. I mean, what do we bring to him? What do we offer as his people? Well, we can offer our thanksgiving. Psalm 118, verse 28, You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. You know, we just finished celebrating Thanksgiving. Joshua and I were driving down Westminster Boulevard the other day, and he looked and saw this tent with all of these Christmas trees, and he said, they're already up. They're already selling trees. And I told him, I said, son, that tent was up weeks before Thanksgiving even hit. They were waiting for Thanksgiving to be over so they can just run full steam ahead into the Christmas season. And, and I mention that because for many people in our country, sometimes even in our churches, we look at one day of the year to give thanks. And the reality is, is that the people of God, we should be giving thanks to him every single day for what he has done. Thanking him for our lives, thanking him for our salvation, thanking him for our families, thanking him for the body of Christ, for the relationships that we have with one another. Thanking him that he, he keeps us safe overnight as we sleep. None of you last night kept your lungs or your heart or your brain functioning. You lied down on that pillow, you went to sleep, and you did nothing to sustain yourself through the evening hours. And then you woke up, and here you are today. Who is responsible for taking care of you while you slept? It's God, Christ. He's the one who is the creator and sustainer of all things. You thank him for that. Thank him that we still have freedom in this country. As bad as this country is getting and as quickly as we're going down that slope, we still have freedom to worship. We still have freedom to proclaim Christ. There are so many reasons that we can give thanks. We should be people who are known for our, our continual giving of thanks to our God. That's a gift that you can give to show your, your um, thankfulness by praising him, proclaiming that. Whether it's silent or verbal, you are thanking the Lord. You give him your love. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Or you don't have to turn there, you can just... Look there later if you like. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. What are the greatest commandments? Well, the first one is to love God. As his people, as his creation, not just as those who are created by him, but those who are recreated through Christ, those who are reborn, we have the means to love God. We know what it means to love God. We can look at Scripture and say, how do we love God? Well, you can look at the first, of the, four, or the first four of the Ten Commandments. Those are vertical commandments between you and God. You honor Him. You, you keep the Sabbath. You don't take His name in vain. You don't worship idols. The other six, those commandments are your horizontal commandments between your neighbor you look here, we are to love him. Love him more than we love anything else with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. It's with everything that you are. With your core being, you love God. You love him, you adore him. There is no greater affection in this world that you have that takes God's place. We are to see everything else as a very distant second. So you love him. How about your bodies? Romans 12:1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And this doesn't mean that you just uh, take care of your, your physical appearance. We are to do that. We do see that there's some instruction about how we are to look, um, how we are to, to present ourselves. We know that we're to take care of our bodies. We're a temple of the living God. 
This is not just talking about working out and eating the right foods. It's making sure that we don't put things into our body that defile us. That could be movies. It could be music. It can be things you read. It could be how you physically take care of your body. But we use our bodies and we are sanctified for the Lord. We, we realize that our bodies are these mobile temples that because the Spirit dwells within us, God is present with us wherever we are. And wherever we are in our bodies and whatever we are doing, we are taking God into that activity with us. We want to make sure that we are preserving our bodies for Him and that they are honorable to Him, a living and holy sacrifice. Our lives in general, everything we say and do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I mean, we are to see our existence as an offering to God. God, the way I handle my money, I'll do it the way you want. The way that I, I manage my family, as you wish. The way that I love my wife, the way I submit to my husband and love him, the way that I cherish her, as you desire. The way that we lead as, as leaders in the church, according to your instructions, Lord. Not for our gain, but for the good of the people and for the glory of your name. The kind of employee that you are. Honest and, and dependable and trustworthy. The kind of employer that you are. The kind of citizen that you are in this country. Making sure that you follow the laws of the land. Those laws that don't command us to do something that's clearly unbiblical. We may not always like them, but we are called to be subject to the government. That's an act of worship. That's an offering we can give to the Lord. Lord, you've established the authority in this country. You establish government. You establish leaders. I will follow them. I don't always agree with them. And where they tell me to dishonor you, that's where I put my foot down and say no. But anywhere else, I will follow. I mean, we can go on and on and on. So many ways that we can present our gifts to Christ, our gifts to God with our thanksgiving, our love, with our bodies, with our lives. It doesn't have to be precious metals or precious oils. It's who we are. It's our emotions, it's our affections, it's our intellect, it's our desires. We present ourselves every day as a gift to Christ. Well, let me leave you with these three as we close this morning. As we continue to celebrate this Christmas season, let me just encourage you as the Magi who demonstrated true worship, rejoice exceedingly because you have found Christ. If you are a believer in Christ today, if he is your savior, you know you have salvation through him, then rejoice exceedingly that he has saved you and that you have found him. Or better, he has found you and called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And bow humbly because we are in awe of him, because we know who he is and how he humbled himself to come to this earth and to, to take upon himself human flesh and to bear our sins on the cross, knowing that he is the almighty God, the creator, and he did that for us, and that he is greater than we can ever imagine. So we stand in awe of him, and we bow humbly, whether that is internally or externally, we bow before him, and then present our gifts because we were created to honor him. That is one of the main reasons why we exist, to worship him, to glorify him, to honor him with our existence. And so as these magi came and, and they were seeking out Christ and, and they acted appropriately when they met him, we should be doing that every day. And, and so I encourage you this morning to, to consider these things and to make these things a reality in your life. And as you're living in this manner, you share with others and you point them to this king that has been given to us as a most wonderful gift. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to spend a little more time in the Gospel of Matthew. And I pray that as we have looked at these verses this morning, we would understand the importance of seeking out Christ. Thank you uh, on behalf of those here, Lord, who have, have found Christ, that you have opened our eyes and softened our hearts, and that you have prepared us to receive your gospel, the good news of salvation through your Son. Father, I pray that we would uh, honor that wonderful gift you've given to us, that we would live lives that are worthy of the King, that we would walk in a manner that's worthy of the new life that we have in Christ. Father, there's someone here this morning who knows about Christ, 
but they don't know him as king. They don't know him as Lord. They don't know him as Savior. Father, I pray that they would be like the Magi, who are humble, and they embrace Christ the King, not like Herod, who, who gives lip service, but has no desire to follow him. It's not enough to say, I believe in God. It's not enough to say, I believe in Christ. It's what do you believe about God? Who do you say that he is? Do you see a need for him? Do you understand your sin before him and your need to be saved by him? Father, there's someone here this morning that needs that salvation, and they recognize today that there is nothing they can do to change their condition, but Christ has done everything for them. I pray that they would humble themselves and that you would just uh, soften their hearts to accept Christ this very day. To know that they have salvation and forgiveness and acceptance through your son as only he can give. Father, as we leave this morning and we sing these uh, songs of worship to you, I pray that it's a fragrant offering to you. That we are excited, Lord, to go out and share the birth of Christ with all those who will hear this Christmas season that we will let it be known that the most important gift anyone can receive is the gift of life through your Son. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.